So I work with startups, both from early stage right through to high growth. And one of the types of startups that I enjoy working with the most are startups who've been found by, founded by engineers. So engineers who've become founders, who've become CEOs, and I love supporting them on that journey. And what's interesting about that journey is the skill set obviously needs to change across all parts of that particular journey. And as an engineer, that's, I think, a greater challenge than perhaps it is from, say, founders who've come from other parts of the business. Because fundamentally, when you're an engineering founder right back at the start of your business, you need to be over across everything. And you are because probably you've coded the majority of the product in itself. You've hired the first sets of engineers. You know how the product is held together at a very fundamental level. There's no separating you as a founder from the product. There really isn't, especially if you're an engineer. There really is no separation there for, for you. And so the first part of that journey, obviously, is that is to split you out from the product and out from the engineering element of that product as well. And that can be quite a scary position to put yourself in because you are giving up what's, in essence, your superpower up to this point of being able to be a fantastic engineer that just knows what they're building and how to build it. Almost you're turning away from what is your superpower that's made you great up until that point. And that's quite a hard personal thing to think about because you started having thoughts about, well, am I suited to be a, a CEO? Am, am I the right person for this job? Is it, is it me? Is it them? Uh, of course you are. You, of course you can do this. But it's quite hard to know what that new superpower needs to be, what other superpowers you can find within yourself to become that the CEO that you need to be, that your business needs to be at that point. And the first step of that, of course, is giving that up, is making that conscious choice that I've got to stop doing this coding. Even if I find it really comforting and a nice place to be and when things are difficult and stressful, I go to my keyboard and I start coding, that can be quite a cathartic thing to give that up. But that can also equally be very, very scary. I worked with a founder a few years ago who was having a particularly tough time. It was in and around COVID. Challenges were happening. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And to help the team, that CEO tech founder over the weekend completely coded up a new feature for the, for the product. You know, it was something that was on the roadmap, something that founder really cared about. They thought, oh, you know, I'll take one for the team and I'm going to spend all weekend putting together this feature. Monday morning came, presented it to the team, expecting the team to be really thankful and grateful for that. But there wasn't that. That feeling wasn't there that that CEO was expecting. And it was that, at that point where I started to dig in, well, why wasn't that there? And if you think about it, well, how were the team feeling at this point? You know, they've spent a lot of time planning, iterating, putting things together, and they've had this brand new feature thrust upon them almost from nowhere by a leader that's very, very difficult for them to say no to. Hey, it's the CEO, I can't say no to this. So there's a, obviously a, a feeling of disempowerment. But equally, when you start to dig into that work that that founder had done over the weekend, was it great? Not brilliant. Was it good? Probably it was OK. The quality wasn't great because they'd not had the QA support. They'd not had the product support up front. They'd not had the design support up front that the rest of the business had when implementing other parts of that product as well. The only thing they offered was a way of that founder to feel better about themselves because they were at the keyboard being productive and creating and making things and that was a big learning for that ceo that actually those things and those skills are not what the business needs right at that time actually the opposite was true and it really kind of disempowered the team the reality is if you feel like you need to go to a safe space like that that's fine go and code something it doesn't have to be on the product you can get have a side product you, know, you can have something that you want to do on the side of this stuff but just noticing in yourself when you get drawn into technical conversations so as a ceo as an engineering founder how do you just notice this within yourself that you shouldn't be drawn into these tech conversations? How do you notice that you're kind of going back to your safe place in terms of technology when you should really be focusing on the larger things of the business? What are the symptoms of that? Let's have a look at them. So the first thing really is you, is you should notice that what you're being drawn to, you're being drawn to technical elements of the business, be that technical conversations, engineering questions, technical oversight. You're drawn to the technical sides of the business. When there's other people that could do that. Maybe they could do it better. Maybe they couldn't. That's not necessarily the point. But you're feeling yourself drawn to those places when things are stressful or difficult. You go there because you feel like, you know, it's a safe, comfortable, easy place for you to operate. So the first thing is just noticing when you get that pull there. The second thing then is to proactively and actively take yourself out of those sorts of situations. So any point where the team feels like they need to run a technical question past you, by always let them do that. But don't feel like you have to give answers to that particular question. They may come to you and say, what should we do here? 
obviously the thing you do here is you coach them through that situation. You don't give them the answers. Because anytime they're coming through to you for an answer and you give them an answer, they then feel compelled to go and take that forward and go and do it. Maybe you've got the right answer. Maybe you haven't. It's hard for you to know at that point. But again, it's all about understanding and talking to the team about why they're coming to you with a particular question. How can you empower them in different ways to come up with the solutions themselves? And again, by all means, if you see them doing something stupid, then stop them doing that stupid thing. You know, obviously, that's the question there as well. And part three of this as well is a, another part of this is, is a story I, I talk about with my daughter. She's six. I live in England. It's raining a lot. Every day I check the weather on my phone and if it's going to rain, I give her an umbrella. OK, and you can obviously see where this is going. There's never going to be a position in her life unless I stop where she's going to proactively look for that umbrella, check the weather herself, get that umbrella herself and go out because I'm doing that for her on her behalf. She's not empowered to do that. Right. OK, quite a classic story. The other side of that as well is so, you know, at points I'm going to have to let her get wet. So she realizes that she needs to check the weather to taking her brother. She needs to take that responsibility on herself. The other side of that story is another story which is around buses. So if I see her about to step off the curb into the road and she's about to step in front of a bus, I'm not going to let her step in front of that bus because it will teach her a lesson. So she doesn't step in front of buses again. Of course I'm not. I'm going to pull her back. And what can happen with that first for, for first, you know, for a technical founder is you start to see everything as buses and not umbrellas. And a key part to unlocking your success as a technical founder is understanding, is the situation where the team are asking me something or I'm seeing this technical challenge here, is this an umbrella or is this a bus? If it's a bus, you know exactly what you've got to do. If it's an umbrella, you can guide the team through the process, but ultimately they've got to make the choices there. And what can happen is you can, everything can seem like a bus to you, especially when you're in that crazy early stage startup founder mode. Um, when you, you've, you've hired a CTO, you've hired an engineering manager, you've hired an engineering team, you hit series A, whatever, whatever those milestones are, you need to stop seeing buses everywhere. You need to start looking for and understanding whether something's an umbrella or something's a bus. And that's a key skill. And honestly, that story is true for any CEO that's out there. And a first time founder can see so many buses when they should be seeing umbrellas. And the reality is, is most of the time these things are umbrellas. But at the time, they might feel like they're buses. And that can be quite a scary proposition to let your team seemingly make mistakes when the reality is they need to sometimes figure this stuff out for themselves. CTO tech founders also, and tech founders themselves, engineering founders themselves, often see themselves as not being great people people. Now, they say limiting things like, oh, I'm much happier with engineers. I don't like enjoy spending time with people. And the reality is, is that's most often not the case is that, of course, people are different from engineers and there's lots of skills that you can learn to help deal with different people. But a big part of that is understanding where that next superpower comes from you as a leader. What is the value that you're offering in this situation? And more often than not, with many um, engineering led CEOs, that strategy that's looking at the market and knowing and using those analytical skills that you're great at to understand, well, where's this market moving? Your customers are probably, again, similarly engineeringly focused. What do customers want and need? Where's this market moving? Where's the, the bigger picture here that I should be following rather than the detail of the product that's going on and deliberately putting yourself into that bigger picture place? Also, other things that um, engineering led CEOs are great at as well is process. Um, there's a fantastic book called Traction, um, Enterprise Op Entrepreneurial Operating System. I highly recommend it. But that talks a lot about as a, an engineering CEO, one of your greatest superpowers is his ability to see to see how things progress and how processes work and taking many of the things that seem to sort of almost happen by magic within a business and creating a process for that. So what, what is the process around onboarding a new engineer? You know, you do it once, you make a process of that, that gets rolled out to everything else that's there as well. So you can see and understand the importance and know the importance of process all the way through. Because again, if process isn't followed, things don't get done. And ensuring that things get done is a big part of what you need to do as, an, as, a, as a CEO. And so by processizing your business, you can get to that point. Rather than doing something once, if you're doing something more than once, then make, create a process for that. Make that process really simple. Share that process. Optimize that process as you keep going through. Hey, everything starts to flow through the business as you move through. Having one-to-one -one meetings with people. Again, many of the CEO, engineering-led CEOs that I work with struggle with challenging interpersonal situations. Maybe somebody isn't performing particularly well. It's about understanding, well, what, as an engineer, 
can I bring to this conversation? And often what happens with a lot with us human beings is we, we conflate expectations and agreements. And this is a big, quite a big concept, but the concept being effectively, we all have expectations of each other. As a CEO, you have expectations of your team. OK, and as a CEO, you have expectations of your engineers and pretty much as an engineer, you probably can meet somewhere in the centre there. As a, as a CEO, you may also have expectations of your sales team, of your marketing team. And it's all about changing them and turning those expectations into agreements. So you know what an agreement would look like between you and an engineer if you're producing a piece of code. Right. You, you know, both know you're going to meet on the same level. The expectations meet. If you're an engineer, you come from an engineering background, you're trying to meet somebody at a different place, sales, marketing, and a specialty you don't understand, that can be much harder for you to make sure your expectations are met with agreements. So what do you do in those situations? Well, you co-author an agreement together. We both agree to do these things. I agree to do these things. I agree to meet these targets or I strive to meet these targets. I agree to meet you once, once a week and I will report back to you on these things. I agree to do this. I agree to do that. I agree as a CEO that I will give you the, the resources you need. You, you create agreements together so everything is in black and white. So you know where you both stand. Expectations are no longer part of what you're trying to do. OK, and as engineers, you're great at that. You're great at processizing everything. So looking and searching for expectations can really, really help you as a, a CEO engineer. When looking for expectations, you can listen for words like should. Every time anybody says should, you know that that's generally an expectation. Okay? Looking for that, formalizing that, having an agreement between you and your direct reports, your C-suite, whoever, can really help to negate those difficult situations when, hey, somebody's not performing well enough. They may not know that they're performing well enough because again, that agreement isn't in place about what that performance might look like. 